Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, I'm delighted to have Ian Dodds with me as my guest. Ian is a very successful CEO and senior executive who has been responsible for driving massive culture change within very large organizations over many years. Ian, welcome. Welcome. Would you mind giving the audience 90 seconds on your background? I I suspect that's probably not enough time to give it justice, but let's give it a go. Yes, sure. I grew up in a council estate in uh, North Yorkshire, and uh, I was lucky enough to win a place at Oxford. Uh, which it was a really outstanding thing to happen for a council house pupil. And uh, there was another thing that happened at Oxford which was significant. That was that I'd realised when I was at school, I was attracted to the girl, the boys as well as the girls, but I hadn't said anything. Anyway, it just so happened, Sir Maurice Bower, who was the head of the college I was at, Wadham College, everyone knew that Maurice was a homosexual, and yet, we all had great respect for him. And I thought that if Maurice can say he's a homosexual, I can tell people I'm a bisexual. And I came out as a bisexual. And now I give talks, I give one to NatWest Bank recently on being a bisexual. After uh, Oxford, I did a PhD in meteorology because I was very interested. I'd have always been very interested in the weather. And I had the most eminent supervisor, meteorologist, who's ever lived as my supervisor, Professor Reggie Sutcliffe. And when I finished the PhD, Reggie wanted me to join his group. And I'd realized that I wanted to work with people. And in particular, I wanted to help people succeed because of my experience of going to Oxford. So I didn't become a, a meteorologist. I joined ICI. And in ICI, I ultimately headed up change management and organization development. And subsequent to that, I set up my own business. That's a really fascinating history. And there's so much that one can explore in that. But it then raises some insight into why you might have moved into the area of inclusivity. So would you mind explaining what inclusivity is and what it isn't? Because I suspect there's an awful lot of misunderstanding around that. Inclusivity means that a people, a person feels valued and respected, whatever their diversity. They feel that they're listened to, they feel that they're empowered, and they feel that they're helped to perform to their best. And they also have a great sense of belonging to that organization. So what are the most foremost common questions people ask you about trying to implement inclusivity within their business? Does it seem feasible from your experience is one of them? How long will it take? Because incidentally, these aren't things you do overnight. It takes several months, if not years. Have you handled a change like this before? And obviously, how much will it cost? Okay. And in terms of feasibility, let's explore that. What are the criteria that you use in order to assess whether it's feasible? Well, to be honest, I, I just do it from my experience. I don't, I, don't do, I don't have any criteria. So I know that if, in fact, uh, the leadership team is fairly capable, that's going to make a big difference. In fact, they're prepared to develop a vision of future success and communicate that across the organization. I know that 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 will help. So those are the kind of things. Okay. So if we look at the kind of programs that you've run, I know that the one you did at ICI in particular, or the many programs, but the first one that you did at ICI was a a watershed moment in their uh, history. Can you talk us through what happened and what impact that program had? Okay. Well, at an early part of uh, my career with ICI, I was made it, what would nowadays be called HR director, who was then personnel director, for a large chemical factory in Huddersfield. It had awful employee relations, awful productivity. It even had a branch of the Communist Party that used to meet on the factory. And 
It had been like that for many years, and it was in danger of closing. And yet it was a major employer in Huddersfield. So I initially did what my predecessors had done. I worked with the managers to try and change things. We made a bit of progress, but not much. Anyway, one day I was driving home, and I'd had a particularly gr gruesome day. And I was thinking, you know, when my mum and dad came home from work, and remember I grew up in a council estate, they often used to spend time in the evening saying, if only our managers would do this, and if only our managers would do that. And it made me realize that there must be a couple of thousand people going home from that factory <laughs> and saying something like that. So the next morning I went in the factory director's office and I said, Bill, what we need to do here is to engage the whole of the workforce in making this the best factory in ICI. We talked about it for a while, and then he said, okay, and we'll go for that, but you'll have to show us how to do it. Now, at that stage, I must admit, I had no idea. <laughs> anyway, I contacted my contact in ICI's group personnel department, and I was informed that there was a professor, Dick Beckhart, working with the board of ICI. Dick Beckhart is the most eminent behavioral change scientist that's ever existed. And it, the, it was agreed that I would meet up with Dick to be coached by him what to do in that factory in between his meetings with the board. And so Dick got me, first of all, to sit down with the leadership team on the factory and help them develop a vision of success for the factory by being one of the best factories in ICI in five years' time. And then we communicated that right across the whole factory. And every team and unit had to tell us what they thought would help and hinder the achievement of that vision. I then sat down with the leadership team and we developed a strategy for delivering the vision, taking account of the feedback that we got on what would help and hinder it. And then I did the thing which I think is most significant and the thing that distinguishes me from all other people. I trained all the managers, this was because Dick Beckard persuaded me to do this, trained all the managers right from the most senior manager right down the front line to be inclusive leaders who valued and respected a person's diversity, listened actively and empathetically to people, helped people identify their talents and develop them and empower them. Anyway, five years later, John Harvey Jones, who was then the chief executive of ICI, came to congratulate the factory on becoming one of the best in ICI. And it's still there to this very day, not an ICI factory, it belongs to someone else now, but it's still giving lots of employment in Huddersfield. And one of the other interesting things that occurred on, on that was that the senior shop steward, Reggie Cross, who was a member of the Communist Party and had the Communist Party meetings on the factory, he developed a great respect for what I was doing because I was engaging the whole of the workforce. And as a trade union leader, he saw that as very important. And he and I became uh, very good friends. And ultimately, would you believe it, Reggie got an OBE for his services to that factory. Wow. That must have been an interesting conversation in Reggie's house. Um, uh, absolutely. He should take it from the Queen. So tell me this then, the skill of listening is something that I find woefully lacking across the board, whether it's in sales, in management, in marketing, in teams. How do you teach people to listen empathically? That's a very good question. I actually have an inter interactive behaviors tool. It has 15 interactive behaviors on it. There are telling behaviors and there are listening behaviors. And what I do is I, I sit in and I coach the managers on the use of these, these interactive behaviors. And what I usually find is that initially they use a lot of telling behaviors and not very many listening behaviors. So I, I then managed to train them in how to use listening behaviors. And one of the things that they very weak at is checking their understanding. So when uh, someone gives a suggestion of, of doing something, then the manager should check their understanding of what that suggestion is. 
how can one get hold of this list of 15? Is, is that published publicly or is that something that's proprietary? It's something that I have. I, 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 I could make it available. I would be extremely grateful if you could, because I think there are a number of obstacles to and barriers to success which stem from lack of listening. I firmly believe that that's something that should be taught in schools. It should be taught at universities as part of every curriculum and every business should have it and certainly managers. Because one of the things that strikes me that happens far too frequently is someone is good operationally or in producer role and then they get promoted into management with next to no training and development. As head of personnel at ICI, did you implement anything like a, a runway uh, so that people were identified and earmarked for a management role and they learned how to do it before they became managers? Oh, yes, that was most important. We uh, put a lot of effort into defining what were the talents that uh, the qualities that successful managers required and then looking, looking for these and then helping people develop them. And when I was on the factory, for example, we made sure that we identified people who were shop floor workers and not just people who were in the lower levels of management. And we managed to promote several shop floor workers to the management positions. And this was very important. So what are the qualities that one looks for in a future manager? Well... I mean, I've already given a hint on, on them to, to some extent. I mean, one is they should be able to look at things in the long, long term. They should be able to analyze what issues. They should be able to actively and empathetically listen to people. They should be able to empower people. And they should be able to help people identify their talents and develop them. And on that note, that's another really interesting aspect that I'd like to go into a little bit more detail on. So in terms of talent development and career pathing, is there a process that one goes through in order to identify those talents and then ensure that you're playing to people's strengths? Well, what I've already done in the organizations I've been involved with is to uh, make, have a method for training the manage managers to be able to I, look for these and identify these when they're doing performance appraisals. And how often should performance appraisals be done? Because typically they're only once a year. And I think well, that's uh, form, formally once a year, but of course, people are on something like not exactly a monthly basis, but every three or four weeks, people need to be giving feedback, both positive and negative feedback. The negative feedback, of course, has to be given in a way which doesn't discourage the person. So if you're giving negative feedback, focus on the behavior and not their identity. Absolutely, absolutely. You focus on the behavior and what they need, what they need to change uh, to do to change that behavior. One of the limiting factors to that is people's level of self-awareness. So how do we um, help managers raise another person's level of self-awareness? Well, it's based on the ability to, first of all, look for people's talents and also weaknesses in their abilities and giving managers the ability to actually discuss these with people in a, a positive and developmental way. So when we're looking at that career pathing, are you helping them put in clear milestones and objectives that people need to work towards and coach them through that process? Yes, absolutely. So what does coaching involve? Because again, this is a skill that I think to a large degree has been lost. And there, a lot of people confuse telling with coaching. And coaching is about getting other people, to, the, the other person, to work out most of the problem, uh, the solution themselves. Yes, How it is. Coach? I mean, uh, coaching very much involves getting the coachee to really identify and own what are the issues that they, they, they need to work on, and then uh, beginning to have a discussion with them about how they actually 
addressed the issues they needed to work on. And that means getting ideas from them and helping them develop those ideas from the knowledge that I have as a coach. One of the really important factors is making sure that the person being coached feels safe. And what I teach my clients is the three P's of potency, protection, and permission. Making sure that both sides have the right to have their voice heard, that nothing will be said that will cause them to be punished for saying it. So we want them to feel safe in expressing their opinions and creating a framework of equal stature, different roles, but equal stature in that. So you're being inclusive, that you're being, you're allowing them to feel confident that they can say what they need to, how they need to say it. How do you teach your trainees in coaching to make sure that those conditions are met? I don't use the route that you do, which I, I must admit, I, I rather like. I simply make sure that I give them plenty of positive feedback, that they realize that I'm listening actively and empathetically to them. And I think it's my behavior which makes them feel um, confident and willing to, uh, able to progress their development. And how do you deliver bad news in a way that's nurturing and inclusive? Well, the way I do it is I always start with a positive factor. So I might say, Bill, you know how much I admire the way you do such and such. However, I really have observed and I know from feedback that there's an area here that you need to improve and we need to work on that. And it sounds to me like there's quite a lot of verbal contracting between the coach and the coachee. Is there a structure or framework that you teach people in order to be able to deliver those? I, I just do it informally. I develop it for each different coachee. Okay. So the, the obvious question there is how do you teach people to replicate that? Because if that's innate in you, then that it's, is that an easily transferable skill? Oh, yes, it is. Could you explain how you've done it? Well, I mean, when I'm training people to be coaches, I train them in, in my interactive behaviors using the interactive behaviors tool. I train them how it's so important that to uh, build up uh, coaches' confidence and not undermine their confidence. I train them how to problem solve and really explore issues and how to agree actions that the coachee might take and ways of the coachee getting feedback on how successful they're being in taking those actions. Okay, so let's move on to questions that people should ask, but don't. What are the three questions that people should ask, but don't about creating inclusivity and a safe environment for people to speak the truth? Well, the three questions that I hope they would ask, is, have you experienced, Ian, of handling a change like this before? What do you think will be the key challenges for us? And then, of course, what will it require in terms of leadership and how much will it cost? Okay. What are the questions they're not asking that, if they were to ask, it would help them progress faster? Well, I mean, the questions I've just said there, they're often not asking. Really? Yeah, yeah. So help me understand this. When you were working in an environment which was heavily unionized, where there was conflict, how do you manage to ameliorate that in a way that when there's clearly a lack of trust, how do you break down those barriers in a way where there's bound to be a pushback and resistance? Well, you see, on that particular factory, and uh, no one had actually engaged the workforce in really uh, having to identify and deliver a vision of future success for that factory. When we actually offered a vision, the vision of that factory being successful and becoming one of the best in ICI in five years' time, that really inspired people. And 
because we'd asked people what would help and hinder us from doing that, they realized that we were going to actually address the issues that uh, were going to need to be overcome to succeed. And how did that affect things like recruitment, retention, productivity? Well, it was interesting, actually, because um, Portisfield has a big Afro-Caribbean population. When we first started, we had no African Caribbeans on the factory. But once we'd actually trained the managers to value and respect person's diversity, to listen actively and empathetically to people, we started, would you believe, to actually bring in African Caribbeans onto the factory. And what's more, they really enjoyed working there and progress in the organization. And how did that change the culture? Well, you see, the culture changed because we were actually changing it from being a command control culture to one where it was high engagement, where people were asked their views, asked what the issues are, and they were listened to. What they'd said was fed back to them, so they knew it had been understood. Very interesting. So, again, in my experience, where you are creating change within an organization, often that can lead to conflict. How do you create an environment where conflict is constructive? Because I think one of the worst things you can do is avoid conflict. How do you make sure that you have constructive conflict where opinions are heard, but even though not everyone may agree, then everyone, that once the decision has been made, everybody supports it. Well, basically, we did have areas of conflict, and we always do in, in big change programs. But the critical thing is making sure that people are listened to, they're given an opportunity to express their views, and then and it's, it, it's made clear that these views are heard, and then they get explained to them why it's important to do things differently. And their help in doing this is actually sought. So I think a really interesting point you've made there is that people uh, know that they've been heard, so they get feedback. I think one of the things that I see happen a lot is companies uh, do employee surveys, but they don't really get any sense that they've been listened to. And it's more of a tick in the box exercise. What change needs to happen at a senior level? for them to really buy into that whole piece about listening to their employees, listening to their suppliers, listening to their customers? Well, when they realize that in the modern world, the most success is going to come from building an engaging and inclusive culture. And obviously that means listening to people and respecting their diversity and respecting different views and opinions. Interesting. Okay, so what if there is a surface level desire to create improvement, but management only pays lip service to being inclusive? How do you then challenge that and break through that kind of implicit bias? What I do is I make sure that the managers get coaching one way or another, or they attend training programs about how to manage and lead in an inclusive manner where everyone feels their diversity is respected and they feel actively and empathetically listened to. And if you have people who are not really willing to buy into that message? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, they've got to be uh, removed from, from the role if they really, really, really not going to change. I must admit, I experienced that very little in my, in my career. And when you did, what was the impact? What was the aftermath of having removed those people? Well, I mean, we uh, brought people who are more operated, more inclusive and engaging way. In. And so that was very positive in relation to their teams. And to be honest, uh, the people we'd, we'd actually removed from the roles, and although we'd given them other positions, which didn't involve managing, they often left. And in terms of morale, when you start implementing more inclusivity? 
I'm assuming it improves. Um, what, oh, it it, what it, 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 go, it goes up massively. And so how does that manifest itself? What changes do you see in demeanour and communication? Another change that I was involved with was with the largest tax office in the Inland Revenue, and it was one of the worst performers of the Inland Revenue. And I did all the things that I, I've explained already. And three years later, it was the best performer in the Inland, Re in, in the Inland Revenue. And uh, it meant that uh, people on, on, in that office, we were very committed to helping it succeed. Whereas previously, when it's been run in a command and control manner, they hadn't been committed to helping it succeed. In Google, they ran a project called Project Oxygen to look for what makes a great manager great. And the number one criteria was that the people in the team would recommend it to people they knew and liked to join. And did you see that kind of improvement where you trained your managers to be more inclusive, that the team members were re actively recruiting people to join the team? Oh, yes. I mean, I explained earlier. Um, how uh, that factory in Huddersfield had not had any African Caribbeans, yet there were uh, a, a significant proportion of the population in Huddersfield. And once we built, built an inclusive culture, they began to join the factory and enjoy working there. And how does that affect the efficiency and costs of the business? Well, I mean, in actual fact, it benefits the efficiency and cost. If you build an inclusive culture, people are more engaged and active and are more, are more focused on helping the organization succeed. And so, I mean, you, you don't have to give specifics, but in round numbers, where you move a business from being exclusive to inclusive, and where managers are listening, what sort of efficiencies are you, uh, were you able to witness? Oh, I mean, you're, you're really seeing improvements of tens of percent. I mean, you're really enabling them to uh, change from being one of the worst performers in the group that they're involved in to becoming one of the best performers. So if you're creating that sort of change, then one of the things that I've observed is that often change programs look at one particular aspect, but it's a bit like taking a photograph. There are three factors that affect the quality of the photograph. There's the shutter speed, the aperture and the speed of the film or the, uh, the chip. And if you change one without changing the other, um, then what you tend to find is the photo looks either washed out or too dark. So in terms of a change program, what causes them to fail? Well, what causes them to fail? And incidentally, I've never had one that's failed. But I would think what causes them to fail is not having a vision of success, which people have bought into and been consulted about and them feeling that people feeling that they're not they're not included and engaged. So to summarize, if I understand it correctly, clarity of vision, which has buy-in from every level, where you engage people at every level in the organization for their input. Their input is valued and heard, and uh, where appropriate, it's implemented. You encourage an environment where people uh, discuss robustly their perspective. You then come to a clear conclusion as to what action needs to be taken. Clear responsibility is assigned at each level and at each stage. People are held to account for their contribution. And there's constant coaching throughout that process in order to ensure that you can make the small adjustments along the way at a macro level and a, uh, a personal level to ensure that you're working towards that common purpose and you're constantly reviewing how you're progressing in order to ensure that uh, you're still on target and what you are trying to achieve is being achieved and it's still relevant. That's excellent, Arcus. I agree with that. There's only one small thing I would add, and that is people being held to account means that they need to get positive feedback. Absolutely. Accountability, I believe, is an internal force. It's not external. You don't hold yes. people to account. People hold themselves to account. I agree with that. Excellent. Okay. 
Ian, let's wrap up on influences. What are the influences that you have been significantly moved by? What would you suggest people read, watch, listen to, to get insight into how to create successful change? Oh, that's a very, very good question. I'm not sure my experience uh, is the same uh, that other people would have. You see, what influenced me was, A, as a working class boy going to Oxford and realizing that I really wanted to help people who came from disadvantaged backgrounds succeed in the world. And of course, I was coached by Pr Professor Dick Beckard. So, I mean, he wouldn't get that coaching, but he has published books. I can't remember the titles. So I'd actually make sure I read some of those. And Beckard is B-E-C-K-H-A-R-D? That's correct. Excellent. And if you had a golden ticket and you could whisper into Ian's ear, age, I don't know, 23, what advice would you give him that may have made his life slightly easier or help him prevent uh, some of the mistakes he'd made along the way? Right. Uh, the thing I would actually whisper in his ear is the importance of developing inclusive leaders because the change program, the one thing which uh, distinguishes my approach to change from most other people's approach to change is I develop, train all the managers to be inclusive leaders. And I think that's the thing that I hadn't realized at 25 or whatever age you said. And it was only on that factory uh, when I was coached by. Uh, Professor Dick Beckhardt, that I actually did that. Before, before I, I got involved in, in Dick coaching me, I had not done that, and therefore we'd not made any progress. There is an interesting book that people could read called Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed, S-Y-E-D, and that's all about creating diverse teams, because without diversity, you only get one perspective. So a, a good analogy he uses is if you show a fish tank to an American or a Western audience, the tendency will be to focus on the fish. If you show it to a Japanese audience, they will focus on the aesthetics of the tank, the gravel, the seaweed, the bubbles. But if you don't have both, you don't get the whole picture. And I think what's really key uh, that's coming from this conversation is that through inclusivity, you have a much broader picture of what's going on and you actually see reality rather than through a blinkered uh, perspective yes i mean if you build an inclusive culture it's a key, key driver of innovation so on that note what type of innovations were driven out of the factory in huddersfield i'd love to uh, find out about that yeah on the on the factory in huddersfield well innovations uh, such as being able to set up teams to solve problems, being able to putting effort into really understanding what the customers needed from that factory, being able to figure out how to actually deliver what the customers needed. Again, this is really interesting. David Epstein wrote a fascinating book called Range. And his posit is that people with a diverse background tend to thrive and be more successful in specialist areas that require creativity. Um, yes. And one of the things that I see happen very often in recruitment is that the typical job specification is around skills, experience, and historical results. And what that does is it limits the variety of people who they tend to recruit. So you get uh, people recruiting in their own image, often only weaker. Um, so again, I'm really curious to see whether or not that was an aspect that uh, you saw significant improvement in. Oh, de very definitely. But uh, managers uh, were, were, were trained to really uh, seek out, out qualities and competencies in candidates. Look for evidence of these competencies and, and qualities, even if the candidates had been doing very different things in the past. So that points to one of the predictors of success that we use in our recruitment activity, which is looking for habits. So repeated past performance is a good indicator of future performance. But having a skill as a one-off or only being able to give one example is a red flag in the recruitment process, because what that tends to do is you hear what you want to hear, 
and you think you've got somebody who can do the job, but often you think you've hired James Bond and you end up with Mr Bean instead. And the reason for that is that they're looking for the wrong leading indicators. What they tend to do is look for lag indicators in the recruitment process. Have you seen that as well? Yes, I agree with that. And that's a very good way of putting it, Marcus. Thank you. Okay. So tell me something. If there was one thing that you could look back on and say, you know, there was a blind spot, I missed that. What would you look back on and say, you know, if if I had my time again, that would be something that I'd have maybe approached differently? Oh, well, I've I've already explained that. And the, the, the blind spot. I was in driving change programs, not realizing until I got involved with Professor Dick Buckard that I needed to train all the managers to be inclusive leaders. Okay, excellent. Ian, this has been a really fascinating and insightful conversation. I can't thank you enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How can people get hold of you? I'm on LinkedIn. Excellent. Okay, Ian, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Yes, you too, Marcus. Thank you. My pleasure. This is Marcus Kauke signing off from the Inquisitor podcast once again. If you found this an insightful conversation, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you've got questions or you feel that you'd be a good guest or there's someone that you would like to have as a guest on the podcast, then please email me at mcauchi at sandler.com. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.